My name is Tom Bongers, and today I'm having the pleasure catching up with Dr. Brigitte van Nierop, founder of the methodology of inclusive job design. Brigitte, welcome. Hi, Tom. Can you tell us in a single sentence what inclusive job design is? Thanks for this question. I'm sure I can. Inclusive job design is one proven working solution for employers to overcome their personnel shortages. I think I need some elaboration. I thought it had to do with creating chances for people with a disability on the labor market. You're quite right, Tom. That is absolutely true. That is what our aim is, to increase the number of working people with a disability. Let me explain my first sentence. We both know there are many persons with a disability eagerly looking for work and cannot find a job that matches their interests and their capacities. And on the other hand, we also know employers are desperately looking for personnel and cannot find it. So what we do with inclusive job design is we look at the work processes and ask questions about the tasks with the aim of creating this awareness within a specific department that some reallocation of tasks could be part of the solution of their personnel problems. And the starting point is always the pain, you know, the, the need of the employer. And what we do then is that within these work processes, we look for administrative, facilitative, logistical, sometimes even organizational tasks of a repetitive nature that do not belong to the core tasks of the professional. And then these tasks are combined into one or more functions and included again in the work processes. And these designed, these created new positions are then suitable for, employer, for employees who are now outside of the open labor market, for instance, and for me, the most important group, for people with disabilities looking for work, people with disabilities being absolutely able to carry out these tasks. Is it that simple? Sounds like it. It would, it would be great yeah, if that was the case. At the same time, ever since we have been testing and applying the inclusive job design methodology, we see employers becoming more interesting, more willing to open the doors for people with disabilities. And the reason why they do that is because we can really help them in solving their personnel problems. And most of them have problems, not finding the right people for the job or too much work for the current personnel they get the burnouts are increasing or knowing that it is in some years experienced employees leave the company because they retire all kinds of hr problems in small companies but also in big companies everywhere and why i like this methodology it's because it's a relatively simple method it's no rocket science it's proven effectively in creating chances for people with disabilities on the labor market would it work in any company looking for personnel or only in some sectors? No, it is not sector related. It's not also any company related. This, it works in almost all companies, but it has to do with companies that need, who are in need of qualified personnel. They should, uh, the personnel should be qualified or have experience. Why? Because what we see in practice that many of these qualified experienced professionals be, are busy with tasks that are not related at all to their core task and can be done by somebody else, not having the qualifications of the one that does it now. For instance, if we look at nurses, we see in all countries that are now working with inclusive job design, there's a shortage of nurses that's in every country. But at least what we see when analyzing is that at least 30% of the work carried out by a nurse can be taken over by somebody else. Somebody being able to carry out these tasks because it's often tasks where only some training is needed to take over. In fact, what it means is that this shortage of nurses is partly due to the directors, the managers of hospitals, care homes, nursing homes, letting their qualified personnel carrying out these tasks. Okay, and then, what to do? Can you change that? I cannot increase the number of qualified nurses. We cannot increase that. But what we can solve is uh, part of the shortages 
and that we that's how we do it is to decrease the task a nurse does that can be done by somebody else in fact and that's what it makes it interesting it's a win situation for the nurse because almost all these tasks are tasks that they do not really like they do them because it's part of the job so if you ask them what they really prefer and that's what we do they choose those tasks that really belong to their core to their profession what they've learned for and i i never forget this first time one of the nurses told me i've studied so many years to become a nurse and then i must do all these tasks i haven't studied for while at the same time there's so much work belonging to my job that i cannot do if you as an inclusive job design can change that i would finally feel good since i'm there to help and support my patients this sounds maybe a bit you know uh, i don't want to do these uh, other tasks that's not the case this is uh, it's not that she feels too good for it it's more that she loves doing the nursery work and would be happy with colleagues taking over the work not belonging to her nursery work it would also mean for her boss that he does not need more professionals of the same type for the same price he can hire others to take over with a bit of training and since these tasks are well defined most of the times and limited in type of tasks many persons with a disability can be potential candidates for these work packages that sounds great do you have more examples from successful practices in the hospital world because there are hospitals everywhere and there are also people with a disability everywhere I, I yes i i have examples yeah from different countries and in different settings and what i find most interesting is that every time the jobs were designed when when all was ready it seemed to be so logical to the ones that were involved often the supervisor and the one making the decisions about the about the budget and the money because that's the one you talk to which is the one that decides whether or not there will be a job One of the most common sentences afterwards after designing the inclusive job is why haven't we thought of this before This is why it's not rocket science it's just opening eyes for possibilities already there and just facilitating the awareness and the change process of those involved In hospitals jobs were designed in the radiation department the nursing departments laboratories even in the operating room I can explain that last one if you want to. Yes, please do. I like the example. There was this inclusive job designer having contacts with the hospital and designing jobs in the laboratories. And then this news because it was interesting was spread around via the internal newsletters of the hospital. And the surgeon picked it up and then requested a meeting with this inclusive job designer. because they have a huge lack of professionals professional operating nurses and they were wondering if this methodology could also work for them you know that that maybe uh it could lead to uh, some relief for their operating nurses because they were working overtime making extra shifts just to ensure that patients could have their operations in time that this inclusive job designer cannot promise anything because she first need to find out the possibilities but what she could promise is that she could follow the steps needed to find out these possibilities and then discuss with them the results and the first step is always talk to the ones who do the job now and she also asked which was very important too she also asked the the decision maker the surgeons in this case whether they would be open to hire somebody with a disability if there would be an added value for them when rearranging this work they were open for that they had a budget for extra nurses though they could not spend it so money was no problem they were looking forward to what came out of it but would come out of it so this inclusive job designer then talked to the operating nurses and also observed them as that is also part of the steps to be taken when you apply the methodology and the the nurses came up quickly with tasks they have to do that can be done by somebody else tasks they do not really like one big task was to sterilize all materials 
all materials used in operations. Meaning, of course, not everything, because part of it will be thrown away, but those materials that could be used for the next operation. And then another big task was to prepare the tools table, you know, for the operating uh, surgeons, because the, that they pick the right thing when they operate. And both tasks took a lot of time. They take a lot of time. And they could easily fill that time. The nurses could easily fill that time with doing other work also needed when supporting the operating surgeons. And while she was observing, she was counting the tasks and the hours. And it was more than a full daytime program for somebody, somebody who didn't need to be qualified because sterilizing was a job quickly learned. And for the other job, they had schedules that how it should look like. And these schedules just need to be followed. So the inclusive job designer was really enthusiastic and already talking to possible candidates, which was quite tricky, but anyway. But then, on the other hand, the nurses, though in the beginning very enthusiastic, were sort of pulling back because they, they were open for the sterilizing, but then for the, for, for the tools table, they were hesitating because they were afraid, well, if, if they do it wrong, what shall we do? And so, they were hesitating to give this, this, uh, this task to somebody else. And they were open about this hesitation. So we had this meeting with them and the supervisor. And this, then the supervisor came up with a solution, saying, why not let the new employees prepare everything? And then you, as an operating professional, do the last check. And that costs what we found out way less time than doing all the tool table preparation. So it was a simple solution for all parties. And so it happened and the job was designed. What made these employers open to act? I would say the employer's approach, really listening to their needs and only looking for tasks that you are sure of people with disability with a disability in the neighborhood of that, for instance, that hospital can carry out. Otherwise, you promise and do not deliver. And yeah, it's talking business from the first moment. You talk about a business case for the organization and added value. And this is something that you have to get used to. It doesn't mean you have to talk business and money all the time, but it means you talk in any case, from the viewpoint of the employer, the win for the employer. Of course, as we all know, Tom, you also, these are, you have clients, the potential candidates with a disability. But you know, you only design jobs for them that match their abilities. So the win for the candidate is clear. The win for the employer should be made very clear. And that's what you do together, step by step, by using the methodology of inclusive job design. But why do you expect people with a disability being the right people for the job? Because that is why we do it. We open doors at employers for those who are vulnerable, have difficulties finding a job. Those people that have absolutely capacities, but because of their vulnerabilities, often do not match the criteria and the vacancies of these employers. And what we do is we match their capacities with tasks of current personnel who can then focus on their core tasks, which is also good for the employer. That sounds like a win-win. In fact, it's a win-win-win. Let me start with the win for the job seeker with a disability, finding a sustainable job, matching his or her capacities. And then there is a win for the employer, solving mostly a part of their personnel problems. And then there's the win for society because the job seeker is working and becoming part of the open labor market, meaning less social costs like disability pensions, like guidance, etc., etc. Okay, I hear your examples, but they're all from the public employment world. Do you have any examples from the private employment world? Are they open to this? Let me give the example of this garage in the eastern part of the Netherlands. I use a garage because there are garages everywhere. 
the owner of this garage had a vacancy for a mechanic already for months. Nobody applied. He had a real problem. Then this job coach, following the training of inclusive job design, visited him and told him about the method and whether the owner would be interested to be his practical assignment. If it doesn't help, it doesn't hurt, was the reaction of the owner. So the inclusive job designer started interviewing and observing and quickly found out there were many tasks done by mechanics that could be done by somebody without this qualification. And he brought into view these tasks, the time. And then all of them, the mechanics and the owner, were surprised by the time spent on such supportive tasks. Together they decided which task they could take out, what some of the tasks they would like to continue doing themselves, and I understand that. But uh, some, some they were open to, to give to hand over to somebody new. And in fact, they picked out only three tasks. And already these three tasks formed a full-time job of eight hours a day, five days a week. And the owner made this calculation, which is open with money. And this positive business case was obvious. As it was for the new employee with a disability, doing a job in the open labor market, in a real garage and belonging to a team for the first time in his life. Great examples. And also examples that may be applicable in other countries too. Well, the garage example is already applied in other countries, as far as I know, in Belgium and in Switzerland and maybe elsewhere too. I think maybe in Norway too. I need to catch up with the examples in other countries. Still, many employers hesitate to hire somebody with a disability. I've got a feeling that I'd rather go to another country than to hire somebody with a disability. I know employers do that. It's interesting to see them going far away to look for personnel and having no eye for those in their own neighborhood, eager to work, able to work. I also know employers, entrepreneurs of, for instance, small or medium-sized enterprises are okay. They are just good. Why would they change their strategies? The thing is, employers need to look thoroughly to their professionals and see how much they do that is really related to their job and what tasks are not really related to their profession. But first, explain them how it works by asking them some questions to increase their interest in what it could mean for them when they apply this methodology and what it could mean to decrease their pain, his or her pain. And the example of the garage is one good example for this. And also, many times there is a positive, positive business case for the employer. I'm always surprised if you, if you look at what if doing nothing or what if we rearrange tasks. It's incredible how much gain there is for an employer. I remember one of the inclusive job designers telling me about this independent demolisher. I found it a very interesting case. It's a one-man company and this man demolishes buildings with his crane and his wrecking ball. And he was at this business meeting organized by a service provider and he heard about inclusive job design. And he then realized he always had to go down from his crane to pick out the copper pipes who are still in most of the older buildings. And these pipes are worth a lot of money. But every time he needed to go down to select these pipes, he couldn't continue demolishing. So while he was listening to this presenter informing him about the methodology of inclusive job design, he made a quick calculation on the backside of his invitation and found out it would be profitable for him to hire one extra person to select the copper. This person needed to be strong and working safe. That's, that's really very important in this case. But the service provider who was organizing this business meeting had several candidates already for the job. And four weeks later, the job was there and still is, since copper is even more expensive now. Are there also employers who are not open for it? And do you have any idea why? It's not they don't want to. Most of the time they have no time to, to look back, to lean back and look, how is my organization organized? Who is doing what? 
And can we do it different? Because of the huge work pressure they feel, there's no time so, to do so. Every time they say, yeah, we have a reorganization, I think, well, that's the best time to lean backwards and look at the possibilities. It also has to do with the rules and regulations in different countries. For instance, if you look in the public sector, in most countries, it's not allowed for non-professionals to have direct contact with patients in hospitals, for instance. And there's also countries where you need to be qualified for everything, even for doing the dishes. And then there are, of course, employers, director, managers of hospitals who've never seen, never encountered anybody with a disability and having no idea how they look like and what they can do. And this lack of knowledge makes them also hesitant in being open to do things different and open their doors for new employees with a disability. That sounds like something not easy to solve. It sounds like it. And it's something that can play a role, especially in public organization. Fortunately, that's only part of society. Most private companies decide for themselves on what is needed for a job. At the same time, while speaking, we see some first step in some countries to change their strategies, their stringent rules related to requirements for a specific job. For instance, there's a huge shortage in the childcare sector, at least in the Netherlands and in Belgium, and maybe also in other countries. And now this morning I was reading in a newspaper, the unions rise up against the government because of the qualifications needed to work in this sector. Of course, qualified persons are needed, it's about caring of children, which is a delicate thing, of course. But at the same time, we've done so many analysis in the childcare sector, and we've seen there's a lot of work that can be done by somebody without qualifications. You need to have the right attitude, of course, and you need to follow a training, but that would suit for being an assistant childcare professional. And in some countries, this job already exists, but in many countries, not meaning new opportunities can be created in this sector. And the same counts for support in nursing homes, schools, etc., etc. So at this moment, many governments feel the urge of doing something to overcome the labor market shortages. And this is one method they can use. Still a way to go. And as I listen to you, it sounds much like a public thing. Not so much for private companies. Indeed. And there are thousands of private companies in each country, and many of them feel a pain, now or in the near future. Then for them, this can be a solution. And we've seen it has been a solution for many already. What you haven't told yet, Brigitte, is the way it works. Thanks for asking, because this is the essential part of the whole methodology. Where do I need to start when I want to apply the method? At first, you might think it's just looking at work processes and selecting tasks and then combine them to a new job. Technically, technically, that is what you do, yeah, that's true. Though much more important is the path you follow. You are entering a company, an organization that is used to work in a specific way. And what you ask them to do is to change their habits. And that's a change process. And you have to create the circumstances to let all involved become open for this change process. And that's the task of the inclusive job designer. Because the people in a company, in a specific part of the company that you, you might analyze, are used to do their work. And then somebody outside, somebody from outside, comes in and wants them to change their daily work. That only works if you include them in everything you do. And then, still, it only works when they see the added value of the change. Only then they are open for it. So applying this methodology successfully means a step-by-step -step approach. One step after each other and no skipping of steps just to ensure this psychosocial change process to take place. We use a model for it, to show these steps and to explain to employers and to inclusive job designers what to do, when and why. Shall I explain it a bit? Yes, please. So the first step is to explore the labor market to select the right employers. Many of them are right, 
but you need, you really need to select. Those employers that work with qualified personnel, there you have the biggest chance. Just as an example, you better go to a lawyer office instead of going to a garden center. Because the people in the lawyer office are all qualified. And then you have your chance of finding tasks not belonging to the profession of the employee is much bigger in the example of the lawyer compared to the garden center. You can do other things in the garden center, but just if you want to uh, implement or apply the methodology of inclusive job design, you have to go to those that are in pain and need qualified personnel. Then you're very welcome. Now, once you have selected those companies, you have to uh, realize the commitment of the decision maker to be open to apply the methodology. So that's what you do in the first phase, have a meeting with them. And, and you, you, you can meet anybody in, the, in, the, in an organization, in a company. But the ones that is deciding is the one that should, you should have the commitment of. Because that's the one who decides to, have, uh, to design the job or to pay for it, which is quite important. So uh, this is why you need to have the commitment of the decision maker to be open to apply the methodology in relation to solving a part of their pain, of their needs. Because only if there's something you can solve for them, your chance is big. If there's nothing to solve, then say goodbye, thanks for the coffee, and go to another one. Once you have this commitment, you have to prepare to carry out the analysis. And it could be that you need to explain more an extra meeting with a supervisor or anybody else involved and interested and also important to include. And once you've done that, you can start interviewing and observing and come up with some intermediate results as a sort of a basis for the supervisor and the decision maker to decide on possible rearrangements and get a first view of possible added value for them. Once you've done that and they see a possible added value, then you continue. And then you sort of write a final report with the findings, the conclusions and the business case. And once the decision maker agrees, then it's like usual. You start with recruitment, but that's what you always do then. So that's the last step. What makes this method new compared to what is already done? First, let me say that all methods used at the moment are good because if, they, if they're there to increase the chances on the labor market for people with disabilities, then it's perfect. What makes this method different is that you actually calculate the business case for the employer. You bring it into view. And we are talking money, if possible. In any case, we are talking a, in, in measurable added value for the employer. For the employee who does the work now, for his or her supervisor, the manager, the owner of the company. And it's, 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 it's quite easy. What you do is you, you have a standard question. You always ask, what if somebody else take over, takes over these tasks? What can you do? And what does that mean for you, for your work? And what does that mean for the department? And what does it mean for the company? We continue asking until we hear something that is measurable or could be money. And then we stop. And in the end, it's always about an added value for the company, the organization. Let me, let me give you the example of the restaurant. The, the, the waiters had a lot of tasks that could be done by somebody else. And then they, if, if that would be the case, then they could concentrate on the guests of the restaurant. And the owners were open to hire somebody with a disability. And these guys are fast and they quickly calculated the impact of this when their waiters could have more attention for the guests. Because in the current situation, they had a shortage of waiters, meaning guests didn't get the attention they needed, like having their drinks on time, having good explanation about the food, etc., etc., a warm welcome. Well, for them, it was obvious there would be a positive business case when investing in one person doing these supportive tasks. 
like putting in the goods into the racks, etc. So they shared their thoughts with the inclusive job designer and agreed on hiring a person with a disability doing these supportive tasks during daytime. They didn't share their figures. They said the gain is clear, we do it. Well, that's okay too, because we, we, could, we could then use their words. It has an absolute added value for us. But in most cases, I must say in private companies, it's quite easy to calculate the costs and the benefits. By the way, the only part for the inclusive job designer is to facilitate the employer in finding out the added value when rearranging tasks. It's not that they have to be economists or calculator. It's just what you do is you facilitate the thinking process in what would be the added value? What is the impact? What can you do? Extra, extra, etc. And that's one of the most essential parts of the methodology of inclusion job design, which is different compared to other methods. So, as I understand you correctly, this calculation of business cases as much as possible in money is something really new. Yes. Yes, in the past years, what we see is that in all countries, we see job coaches and all those involved in the placement of people with disabilities on the open labor market. They are more and more employer oriented. They listen to the needs and they are more and more uh, focusing on what the employer really needs. But this calculation of the business case bring really into view the added value is something that can make their case even stronger, more robust, and in that way, increase the chances for their clients. And that's why we do it. Then Brigitte, as a critical friend, I'm also interested in success rate. Do you have any proof this method works? Some proof is already there. But at the same time, please take into consideration this method is still quite new. And there are some facts to present. First of all, which one I really like, is that one in three placements in the Netherlands is realized by rearranging tasks. And this was a study presented already some years ago. And then we did ourselves a short qualitative study and asked some inclusive job designers who have been working with the method for some years, what they experienced as being different compared to their former way of working. They were clear about the time it costs to follow the methodology. That is really much more compared to how much time they spent before on trying to create placements for their clients. But at the same time, they were also clear about the long-term results. Where in the former situation, more than 50% of their clients returned to them, losing their job because the match was not good, of any other reason. And in the new situation, when applying the methodology of inclusive job design, this was less than 20%. A huge increase in long-term success. For them, a reason to continue. Anybody who is working there is, has followed the, trainer of, the training of inclusive job design. And with the years passing by, they became much faster in analyzing and designing jobs, which increased the win factor for them as service providers. Well, Brigitte, you gave me a good insight of the inclusive job design methodology. Now tell me, what would be your biggest wish in relation to your work with this methodology? I think I would be happy if more and more employers opened their doors and let somebody experienced find out the possibilities in their company, their organization. They will be surprised about what could be possible. 